Hi, I'm, I'm James Barrett, and I want to thank Mary and Janice for inviting me here, and I'd like to thank C-SPAN for being here. Um, I think this is, this is such a, a great bookstore. It's, it's good to re remember when books were only sold in bookstores. And this one's kind of a miracle because it manages to, uh, to me, it kind of captures the uh, wild and mysterious bookstores of, from when I was a kid. They were just uh, a, little bit, a little bit spooky. Uh, but very, but very rich and 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 fascinating, and that's what that's what this one is. It, it, and obviously, it's all it's also such a great meeting place for people. So I want to thank them uh, for inviting me. Um, I've written a book about artificial intelligence, but my usual job is documentary film producer. I've made a lot of films. You might have seen on uh, National Geographic Channel, on PBS. Um, here are some. Some are available on Netflix. It was through documentary that I became interested in artificial intelligence. Uh, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight. Uh, artificial intelligence, what it is, and why I think, and a lot of uh, AI researchers and AI makers think, it's being developed in, a, in the wrong way. I hope to give you some things to think about because I really believe that this conversation is the most important conversation of our time. So let's begin with this. What is artificial intelligence? It's the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, and such as visual perception, etc. The human intelligence phrase throws the whole idea of AI back to humans, because by and large, the only intelligence we know much about is human intelligence. And human intelligence with AI, it's both the study, it's the subject of study, and it's the tool with which we, we uh, try to penetrate what intelligence is. And this is what makes AI fascinating to me. It's the most inward looking of any of the sciences. It involves psychology, neuroscience, medicine, statistics, uh, and a lot more on top of programming and um, computer science. It makes us ponder what it is we're looking for when we hope to mirror human cognition in machines. The science of AI asks us, what do humans do? What are you? What is intelligence? There are a lot of definitions of intelligence um, in, in, the AI in AI research, the AI research business. I like this concise one. It says that intelligence is the ability to achieve goals in a variety of novel environments and to learn. And there's a lot packed into that definition. It says intelligence is goal-oriented. So if the intelligence is not doing something, it's 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 uh, not displaying intelligence. Intelligence should be mobile and probably comes with a body, although that's a point of contention whether or not it needs a body. It's because if you can't move around and adapt, your intelligence may be poor quality. There's no way of really testing it. To move around, you need some sort of body. And you must learn from experience. And this is a real important one for, for, for AI. Most animals come with all the abilities they'll ever have, not humans. We can learn new languages, sports, jobs, crafts, etc. Of course, other animals can learn, but nothing, on the, nothing like the scale of humans, and it's because of our intelligence. I've been interested in AI for, for several decades, but then one year I got really bitten by the AI bug, and I, I was uh, working for the Learning Channel back when it was the Learning Channel, and uh, I, I, was, I was making a film about artificial intelligence, and I got to interview the man who was my hero at the time, Ray Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil, as you know, is a uh, pioneer of speech recognition technology, machines that read books to the blind, and many other inventions. He's been called the Thomas Edison of our time. He's the man that's really coined the term singularity, or he's rebranded re the term singularity, which has actually been around for quite a while. He's now chief engineer at Google in charge of their project to reverse engineer the brain. And most AI researchers I've spoken with think reverse engineering the brain is the fastest way to create artificial general intelligence, which is human-level intelligence in a machine, reverse engineering of the brain. And that might be something you want to look into. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating. I'm not going to go into it at much depth. I also got to interview another hero of mine back then, Rodney Brooks. Rodney Brooks is the foremost roboticist of our time. The company he founded makes, it's called iRobot. He's now, uh, he sold it. He's moved on. This is a general purpose robot called Baxter that is designed to, to, uh, to learn, to be able to do things in your home or in factories, just a multi, or he Im imagines them working on farms. Um, 
right now, but he, but he also, but he, iRobot makes robots that vacuum your, the Roomba that vacuums your floor, but they also make a lot of battlefield robots, robots that carry guns. And there's a debate going on right now that's a very important debate about whether or not battlefield robots should be autonomous, whether or not they should make the kill decision without a human in the loop. And that goes for drones, too, and I'm going to get more into that a little bit later. Ironically, I'm going to Sudan in 10 days, and I'm taking two iRobot robots. Uh, they're going to help us, yeah. They're going to help us, um, they're called first looks, and they're small. They're going to help us go into a, a pyramid that hasn't been explored, but it's got a lot of rock fall, so all the passages inside are, are we can't get through to. They'll, they'll be excavated eventually uh, while we're there, but the first thing to do is to put these robots in and try to get a, a sense of what, where, how, what's the fastest way to the burial chamber, uh, what does the overall layout look like. Um, and obviously, you know, don't let the title of my book mislead you, but I, I really like robots, I really like AI. Um, Kurzweil and Brooks were both very optimistic about the time that's coming when we'll share the planet with machines that are smarter than we are. Kurzweil, in his nonfiction books about the singularity, predicts, predicts AI will help us solve every medical problem facing us, including the overall general problem of mortality. Um, but after Kurzweil and Brooks, I interviewed Arthur C. Clarke, before, who created the HAL 9000 from, from A Space Odyssey. He wrote the book that Kubrick made the, the film about. But he, he, before he became a science fiction legend, he, uh, he had a background in mathematics and physics. And then he went, won every, went on to win every award in science fiction. And he was not optimistic about sharing the planet with smarter than human machines. He, sa he said, intelligence will win out and the intelligent machines will dominate us. And to paraphrase what he said, it was something like this. We humans steer the future not because we're the fastest or the strongest creature, but because we're the most intelligent. When we share the planet with creatures, sm creatures smarter than ourselves, they'll steer the future. And that idea really infected me. Um, this was back in 1990, and I started interviewing AI makers and uh, roboticists shortly after that uh, with the, and, and to, to work out this idea and decided to write a book. When I spoke with artificial intelligence programmers, I posed them a question. Sure enough, everyone told me or agreed with the premise that in a hundred years, most of the decisions affecting our lives will be made by machines. So I began asking follow-up questions. Will that transition be friendly? Will that be a, a handover or a takeover? Will we change ourselves to become machines with brain modifications, which is Kurzweil's singularity? Or will we create machines smarter than ourselves, and will those machines somehow replace us? What I learned is that if we proceed on the course we're currently following, and I want to explain why, we'll create intelligent machines that won't be benign or harmless. They'll develop their own drives, like resource acquisition and self-protection. They'll start out being our tools, but quickly we could become their tools if we continue to exist at all. My book is called Our Final Invention, Artificial Intelligence and the End of the Human Era. The book's thesis is that we need to develop a science for understanding smarter than human intelligence before it's created, before we create it. The two years I spent writing the book threw me into a world of people who had always been driven to create smart machines. Most of the scientists working at high levels in AI have known they wanted to create smart machines since they were teenagers and children. And they burned with that goal their whole lives. It also immersed me in the, into the lives of, of people who are just as determined to stop the reckless use, the reckless development of advanced AI. The two years I spent writing the book were among the most intensely enjoyable of my life because I got to speak with all these people, but also the most harrowing because I went looking for, uh, uh, I, I got more than I bargained for. I went looking for a fish and I found a whale. I found, uh, I found more bad news than I, than I was really prepared to find. So let's jump in. How do, we, how do we get from smartphones in our pockets to super intelligent machines that could threaten our existence? So let me ask you a question with a show of hands. Do you think scientists can make a machine as smart as a human? Okay. So if not, then the problem is either too hard in an engineering sense or there's something about the human brain that defies engineering. So 